Last year in July, July 11th, I was at the BC National Jam, was there any? And I tore my Achilles tendon. Um, and it's essentially been, it's been a 12 month process to be healed. People ask me, how, you know, how's your Achilles? I'd say it's still 95%, it's not 100%. Um, it's not something you ever want to have happen to you. And it happens primarily because of, um, because of bad mechanics, right? When you're, if your foot can't dorsiflex properly, it starts moving out to the side in order to, uh, in order to gain mobility. So if my foot can't flex this way, as I come through here, it turns this way in order to do that. It creates a shearing action on your Achilles tendon. You do that over and over again on many, many jumps over years, you can develop a tendinosis, which is basically a disordering of the uh, collagen in your tendon. And once that's developed, sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's not painful. If it's not painful and you don't notice that there's a swelling in your Achilles, it's gonna tear. Ivan Ivankov is one of the greatest gymnasts of all time. Before the 1992 Olympics, he was in his doctor's office, walked out of his doctor's office, stepped off a curb and tore his Achilles tendon. Six weeks before the Olympics. You, have, you want to be on top of these things. You want to be creating position. We talked about that model of a, if you imagine the human body like a car, right? You want to make it a high performance car. We can build a bigger engine, but if the alignment's bad, the shocks are bad, the, the frame's crooked, it's not going to express high performance. Or it's going to express high performance with a lot of costly um, margins. Does that make sense? So we need to create proper biomechanics in people. And we face, as people in the West, um, a series of, of consistent problems that really mess up our biomechanics. We sit in chairs all the time. Uh, Kelly Starrs, one of my favorite guys, talks about, uh, about mobility, Scott. <laughs> yeah. We call it death by right angles. You sit like this all the time, your hip flexors get tight, your uh, glutes are basically getting he adhered, you get that posture over there, demonstrated by Mike. <laughs> Shoulders forward, head forward. All these things are changing the proper dynamics of your body. They're affecting how your body can move. They're changing the potential that you can have. So by really addressing your mobility, we can open up freedom of how you can move and we can create a structure that's more sound over time to really uh, train properly. So uh, we've got the sitting problem. That's tight hips, that's weak glutes and hamstrings, that's the peroneal nerve, the sciatic nerve coming through your hip, being tied down to uh, tissue around it so that it's not innervated properly, so you don't get good um, response from your glutes. That's kyphosis, that's lack of kinetic understanding of your lordotic chain, your, your lumbar spine. That's head forward posture, all those things that we consistently face. If you really want to be the best athlete you can be and you want to express the highest levels of, of physical potential, you need to address that. Uh, so Mike has been helping many of us here at Park Organs express that by uh, getting in there and working on our tissue. And he's gonna, um, He's going to give you guys a real deep overview of it. He's studied this much more in depth than any of us have had the opportunity to, so he can give you guys a really fundamental understanding of how the body works and how we can start mobilizing it. And then we're gonna show you guys some of the tools that we play around with in order to really mobilize people. Well, Mike, you ready? Yeah, no, yeah, yes, yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, then take it away. Thank you, Ray. Um, and uh, my name is Mike. I like teaching anatomy, and I do that in a number of places. I also like making very complicated things a little simpler. But long before I uh, started doing that, uh, I was an athlete in a young sport. Really hardcore athletes who knew they could try hard. They knew they could train hard, but they didn't know much else. Uh, and as a result, I saw a lot of friends, a lot of brothers and sisters go down with injuries that in retrospect were probably not necessary. Uh, and you know, they had a career that lasted 10 years and not 30. And so I got into body work and I'm a massage therapist, I'm a body worker because um, I'm really interested in helping people be creative and be in their best physical selves. Um, 
by both informing them on a brain level but also on a body level as to how how we can move, how we can uh, move without pain, how we can recover from injury, prevent injury, etc. Um, that sport was ultimate frisbee, it wasn't before. But does that sound familiar to you guys? Yeah. yeah. So this was really what got me started and uh, you know, in, in massage therapy. And since then I've really been, uh, it's taken me lots of places uh, as far as what kinds of modalities or, or how I look at a body uh, when somebody steps in my office. And I'll say, first thing I'll say is let me have you just stand with your shoes off and I'm just gonna look at your whole frame. Um, and that's a structural bodywork perspective. So uh, much like uh, you know, a lot of folks in the parkour community, you guys have a super high IQ when it comes to how to move dynamically. And what I'm looking at is the holistic structure of somebody just, just standing. The very subtle things. Is there a little bit of a spiral torque in this leg? Is there a little bit of a closer relationship between this scapula and this rib cage? What's that gonna do if this scap is stuck to this rib cage? When you go up with both arms, this arm's gonna have a little bit better reach, and all of a sudden there's gonna be a crimp at the shoulder or something like that. Uh, does that kind of make sense, this sort of thing? So these broad relationships across the body is one of the things that really interests me. Um, and I love that we're doing this mobility talk right after uh, Rene's uh, you know, strength training. So, so this was really about, um, so this talk is really about how do we, uh, once we get that strength, once we get the good form up here, how do we make sure that our, our bodies can, can make the best use of it? Uh, and uh, this is what we're talking about. Can you guys read that? Hello. It's the first thing we're doing. <laughs> and that we've pretty much covered. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, I have a hope for this, for this talk, which is that uh, there's only so much we can deliver as far as information or as far as demonstration. But I'm kind of excited. I'm excited uh, because this is, these are some of the best dressers I have ever seen, I have ever met in this room right now. And you guys have so much creativity. You guys know how to be creative in your craft. So what I want to do is, is, is uh, more than anything, is to show you a couple of examples and then trust you to take this back to your communities, take this back to your personal training, and make it come alive. So don't take my word for it. Don't trust me too much on this stuff. Make it work for you, okay? So why mobility? Uh, Rafe is gonna talk a little bit about um, who cares? Why, why should we care about mobility uh, in the body? So we kind of talked about this uh, when I introduced the speech, right? Injuries, why did I tear my Achilles tendon? It's hard to break down every possible reason, but I believe a contributing factor was that I lacked the capacity to dorsiflex my ankle properly. And then that was due to a lifetime of wearing shoes with an elevated heel. S sneakers, classic running shoes, right? Um, High heel shoes, right before too many pumps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in my former life as a transvestite, I <laughs> damaged my uh, future parkour career. Uh, so if we can learn what it means to be anatomically kind of right and have proper mobility, and we can maintain those positions, we can approach doing our sport with a lot more capacity to be safe. If we, if we have to make movement compensations, if it's turning the foot out in order to get our knee forward, um, because we can't dorsiflex, that has effects up the kinetic chain. If it's, um, pushing our chest forward in order to get our arm overhead because we don't have the capacity to externally rotate and get that shoulder away from the acromanial joint, that has effects down the kinetic chain. All of these things are important if you're going to stay safe. Second thing is positioning is strength. Positioning is power, right? If you, if you squat with bad positioning, if your legs are in here and stuff, you're not gonna be able to express as much power as if you can learn to get those knees out, get that joint lock uh, into a close tie position, and get your glutes turned on, right? If you can get into the right position, you can express uh, strength better. And um, essentially this, this idea, your, your body has uh, what we call length tension relationships. At a specific length of your muscle, it can express the greatest force. 
right? So if we compromise the capacity of the muscle to be in the right position, then we're not going to be optimizing that, right? If we're, if, if I'm trying to fire the muscles back here, but they, it's too tight and I have to throw my shoulder forward, I'm compromising the ability of the muscles to do their work. In addition, um, if we can kind of expand the range of what we can do with the muscle, we actually have a wider range of, of kind of area under the curve to work with, if that makes sense. If we have a bigger curve, then the area under the curve that we can express high force with is potentially larger. Does everyone may all understand that? So uh, I believe Mike's gonna take it away from that. Yeah, just to drive that point home, you have every muscle, let's take a segmented kind of, how about this? Let's take a segmented kind of reductionistic view of the body, let's break it down into pieces, um, and say take one muscle, every muscle has what you call 0% stretch, there's no mechanical strain on it whatsoever, and then 100% stretch, the place where it just won't lengthen any further. It turns out that um, due to the, the way that muscles contract on a molecular level, you're gonna have the greatest power in that middle range. So if you're interested in having explosiveness and having power and having access to what your muscles do best, um, it's nice to have a little bit more mobility because you're essentially taking the effective range of the muscle from this to that um, by gradually increasing your mobility. Now the problem is that we usually have kind of a uh, let's say a limited sense of, of what actually limits mobility. Um, what are the tissues actually involved in mobility? Uh, some of us have a good kind of understanding of, you know, muscle bone relationship. At least that's how we think uh, most easily of our anatomy. You got a skeleton, and then you drape a bunch of muscles on that skeleton, get yourself a staple gun, just to make sure they all attach well, and then move yourself around, right? Um, but of course, it's kind of backwards. We actually build our bones last. The bones are the last thing. Uh, and so there's a lot more anatomy uh, that uh, we can talk about, and we're gonna talk about a, a couple of examples of anatomy tissues that actually affect our mobility. So how do we create mobility? I don't suggest this method, but you can try if you want. What are you targeting in the various methods? There's a, there's a hundred different modalities, a thousand, a hundred thousand different modalities for creating mobility, and I'm going to list them all now. No. But I am going to tell you about what they tend to focus on. One of the things they focus on, sorry about the contrast, but is joint capsules and ligaments. A joint capsule is a fibrous sleeve around any uh, synovial joint. That is, most of the joints you're used to moving, the joints with fluid on the inside that move pretty well, they have a sock around them that's made up of a very thin kind of ligamentous tissue. This contains the fluid and it also is the, the last line of defense for a joint. When you dislocate a joint, that's the last thing that has to give way before you, you, your, the bones actually go out of place. Does that make sense? Joint caps. Okay. The next layer out, the next layer of protection for any joint is ligamentous protection. So we have these concentrations of collagen, concentration of connective tissue, that support joints. Here's a patellar ligament right here. Uh, here's uh, the uh, acromioclavicular, rather, uh, coracopromial ligament, etc. cetera. Um, and so these are just thickenings of connective tissue that help support joints. The reason why I can do this with my finger but I can't do this with my finger if I try is because I have ligaments stopping me from doing that. They're very useful. That's one target tissue. Another target tissue is muscle tendon units. That's the one you might be more familiar with, which is this, uh, this chain, bony attachment, tendon, muscle, tendon, bony attachment. Uh, and you can target that whole unit to create mobility. And then lastly, we have fascia. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the term fascia or fascia. Wow, nice word. What is it? It's when you foam roll. Oh, it's fascia! <laughs> it's, uh, it's when your muscles are sticking, or like basically like holding to the shoulder, like you're 
It's, it's what muscles adhere to, that's true. The casing around the muscles, around the bones, it's, uh, it's the tissue that sort of connects everything together. Connective tissue. <laughs> Fascia is, let's say, the, the most common example of connective tissue. Um, and the, you know, if you go to massage school, uh, the first thing you learn about fascia is it's kind of like saran wrap around the muscles. Um, it's all the marbling in the steak before you cook it, okay, all the white stuff, right? Um, but one thing you notice if you look closely at that, at that uh, cross section of, of meat is that actually it's not just around the muscle, right? Here you got a muscle in cross section, right? And you do indeed have a good thick layer of connective tissue right around the muscle, but it's scalable. If you keep zooming in, you keep finding fascia between every subdivision. So you have little subdivisions of muscles, and each of them has their own favorite little fascial compartment, and then subdivisions of subdivisions down to the single cell fascia is covering. So, um, connected, and it's not just muscles, by the way, it's your organs, it's your nerves, it's your bones, uh, uh, and, and so fascia is everywhere in your body, and it's one of the things that if, if you're a structurally oriented athlete, and especially if you're in some kind of manual or physical medicine, it's where it's at. It's one of the most exciting pieces of orthopedic medicine these days, is we're discovering all kinds of things about fascia connective tissue. It, it turns out it's very smart. Uh, it's neurologically active. It's laden with mechanoreceptors. Uh, it can change its tension sometimes in response to inflammation. So it's a very interesting tissue, um, and uh, and it is oftentimes the missing piece, the thing we don't notice, uh, uh, limiting us uh, in certain kinds of mobility. Here's a picture of fat. Okay. So all this white stuff. Here, if you pull apart layers, it'll, it's kind of this, this stringy, pearly, crystalline tissue. It's everywhere. The other thing I want to say about methods, and, and by the way, I, I really enjoy talking and talking fast, but if you have questions, you really should stop me and say, Mike, that doesn't make any sense. Does that work? We tend to think of those tissues, joint capsules, muscle tendons, and fascia, as mechanical tissues. We tend to think of them as mechanical because we discovered them by taking dead bodies and cutting them open. Um, and there's a few differences between a cadaver and a, and a living, breathing human being, uh, if you haven't noticed. And, and one of the differences is that, um, is that the nervous system is not active uh, in a cadaver. And so you don't know, you don't, we don't think of these as intelligent structures. Uh, but it turns out that there are, as far as all the methods for creating mobility, there are neurological ones and there are mechanical ones. I can think in the same exact move. If I take, if I, here's Rafe, you know, working on his extensor compartment of his forearm, right? And me, the massage therapist, I say, I would like to take the fascia, the muscle tendon unit, the deep ligaments of this part of the body, and I would like to create some more mobility in them. I can have the same move. You doing okay with that pressure? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I can have the same move, and I can think of it in terms of mechanical intent. What I'm doing is I'm slowly engaging. We'll, we'll play with this kind of thing a little bit later. And I'm letting that tissue melt a little bit. I can think of this mechanically, like, oh, this is like a rubber band or a stick of butter, and I'm waiting for it to melt and let go a little bit. You doing okay? Great. Okay, awesome. good. Thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs> May I have another, sir? That's what I like to hear. Okay. So, or I can think of this in a very different way. I can think of this, I'm talking to his nervous system, and I'm waiting for an intelligent response. And it turns out that, that uh, the two are always active. You're always going to be working with a mechanical, molecular, tissue level intent, but you're going to be more successful if you add in this component of, oh my goodness, this body is intelligent throughout. So, you know, yes, you are like a car, and you might have busted shocks, and you might have a carburetor, but here's the difference. You're also your own mechanic, right? You're also rebuilding yourself all the time. Uh, and so, respect it. Uh, this, 
your mind is not just in your brain, okay? It's everywhere in your body. Right. Different methods tend to create mobility via different means. They have different theory behind it. Some more on the mechanical end, neurological, but it's a spectrum. They include both. This, this, I think this was, Rafe, Rafe used the term stupid feet, and I like the, uh, <laughs> I like the term. So, some examples of things that I tend to see, uh, both in the population at large, but also in the parkour community, and I've had an interesting couple of years working with y'all, you have a unique flavor to the kinds of injuries you have. Um, one of the things that I see a whole lot of is rib cage compression. Why don't we, well, actually, why don't we go over here? I'm gonna, yeah. Um, no, I'm gonna have you, you stand. I'm not, I'm not gonna work on you. I'm just going to have you like exemplify these, okay. these qualities. Great. This is one of my favorite is, is rib cage compression. Um, and so um, what you see is the rib cage has all these spiral layers of connective tissue around it, arcing around in various directions. And you know how if you take like a Chinese finger trap and you try and just pull it, it's got, you know, it's got this compressive quality to it. Okay, so all I have to do is take a strap of tissue this way, a strap of tissue that way, and I start to create a cuff, like a compression on the rib cage like that. And you add to that a, maybe a little bit of an imbalance. Maybe Rafe likes to play guitar in his spare time. Okay. <laughs> Spending hours jamming. Okay. That's not the only YouTube videos he films or parkour, right? And then and then a little bit of an imbalance, and all of a sudden, all this compressive force is hugely biased to one side. So, to that end, so maybe I'm trying to turn this this way. To that end, I see a lot of, let me relax, um, I see a lot of pain and dysfunction in park, in tressors from here to about there. The back and the bottom of the rib cage. Right? Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Does it's that sound familiar to any of you guys? Okay. okay. So, um, so what happens when you take the rib cage, part of it is the language, it's not really a cage, it's more of a basket, we'd like the ribs to move. You make it stiff, well, what we say is, aha, I can see in the mirror that my ribs are over here like this, but we don't really know how to release it, so what we say is we start to use our scapulae and we say, okay, rib cage, get over here, drape our scapulae on, it's a whole other layer of tissue that we're using to correct for some imbalance. And now we've got an antagonism between the shoulder complex and the rib cage. Get over here. I'm perfectly aligned. I don't know why I'm in pain. Mm. Oh. I see this in, in the tech industry a lot. You know, a lot of Microsoft employees, they're like, I don't understand. Like, I have the desk at the perfect height. I never deviate from this position, and I still have pain. Mm. Okay. Um, and so this is a real issue because if the scapulae can't move now, you're starting to see this pattern, core working its way out to periphery, where you got a little bit of an issue here and then, and then functionally you start to compensate and now all of a sudden when you go up with this arm, you need more motion from the ball and socket because the scap doesn't move. And then you need more motion from the elbow because the ball and socket starts to get a little injured, right? And then you have to work harder in your wrists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so all, all, oftentimes when you have some distal injury, some dysfunction out in the, in the ends of you, it has an origin or it has an excuse that starts in the core. So rib cage out to shoulders is one really common pattern. Um, stupid hips. Stupid hips. Uh, uh, I have one perspective on this, which is, uh, Rafe, this is kind of more of an observation of, of you, but I think we, we, were, yeah. we were talking about this you know, earlier as well, that, that um, I think Rafe pretty much covered it, that basically we, we spend so much time in a certain position that, uh, that when it comes to taking landings, when it comes to exploding out, I think, Rene, you were talking about this as well, right? It's like we tend to overwork our knees. We tend not to engage our glutes very much. Uh, and so there is both a restriction problem in the hips and, uh, and firing problems, actually, actually firing. But, you know, Rafe was talking to me the other day about, like, something he sees all the time is, like, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate this because my mechanics may be terrible, right? Is I'm, gonna, I'm trying to do a tic tac off this wall, and as I do it, my knee is going to collapse in. Why? Partially because my hip is immobile, 
What I would love is for this hip to, to be out here, but the immobility, the tightness of my hip is going to draw my knee into a medial collapse. And that's going to both reduce my power and also prevent, potentially cause injury. Any further thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I heard, I think it was, uh, I believe Dan John made this observation. We tend to think of uh, our body as being on top of two columns when we should really think of the upper body as being slung in between the legs. And we need to create the freedom for your torso to stay in one position and not get dragged with your pelvis. What we see with most people is as soon as we try to drop the pelvis down, the back gets dragged along with it. But this doesn't need to happen. You need the freedom through your hips in order to keep the back in a straight position. This is as far as I can go right now. I'm not warmed up. If I can warm up, I can get deeper. But I still have those limitations. We need to be able to, uh, to create that movement through. And so when we look at traceers and we're landing, and we're landing a big drop and we're coming down here, a lot of times there has to be a compensation of the kinetic chain because we just don't have the mobility to our hips. So either the knee is dragging in here or we're rounding of the back over, which I think is a big thing to do with that rib cage compression uh, piece that he's talking about, or rounding of the lower back out, right? But if we can really get out here, boom, and come all the way down, we can keep the upper body kind of independent of the action of the pelvis, we're gonna be in a much better position. Yep, and we pretty much talked about valgus knee. That's, that is probably the number one problem that we see in tracers, is that when they land, the knee caves in. Uh, if you were here for the warm up earlier, we had everyone do the, uh, the little jump from your feet and land, uh, jump from this position and land here. Almost everyone has a little bit of that knee falling in because we lack that dorsiflexion and we lack the proper mobility through the hip to get our, our, our femur out into an externally rotated position that's strong and we can move powerfully from. Um, I just, I gotta keep going on that valgus knee thing because raise your hand if you have had knee pain from parkour. <coughs> yeah. Uh, patellar tendonitis, Osgood sliders, Connor Malaysia, ACL tears, all of those things predominantly come from a valgus knee fault. Okay? This is a huge issue for us. We can take one thing away. Learn how to get your knees out over your toes. Does that make sense? Um, and that connects to the next thing. Great. So the yeah. valgus knee is, is that specifically when the knee comes in? Valgus knee is here. Varus knee is out here. Oh, we rarely see varus knee problems. Uh, Kyle Grusman is one of our coaches. He's the first person I've met in the parkour community who has pain in his knee due to a varus problem. A lot of knee problems we see tend to have some relationship both to the feet and to the, to the hips. They're usually uh, a result of uh, an accumulation of other issues. I want you guys to just uh, do a little experiment with me. Everybody take your, your shoes and socks off and stand up. I want you guys to, to stand, try to kind of weight one leg, and I want you to just completely see it and just see if you can completely relax your glute. Feel what happens. Just let that glute rest and relax. Okay. Now I want you to look down kind of at your foot position. Now I want you to squeeze that glute as tight as you can. What just happened to your foot position? Did you just create an arch in your foot? Right? Your arch gets tighter and your weight moves out over the outside of your foot. So all these problems, stupid hips to collapsed arches are connected, right? And it can move from the bottom of the chain up or the top of the chain down. Does that make sense? So if, you, if your glutes turn off, you're more likely to end up with uh, a collapsed arch. And if your arches are collapsed, you're more likely to need to compensate by using your glutes. That make sense? Or some other structure. So what advice would you give when you're training someone who has collapsed arches already? They've already... Make sure their glutes are really strong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Justin has collapsed arches. Uh, Justin Sweeney, he has bony remodeling. Um, Justin, we've worked a lot on getting his knees out and having uh, uh, really strong glutes, and he has beautiful positioning. His landings, everything is great. You're awesome, Justin. You, you overcame it. Justin, so his foot is flat, 
And when you, if you look at someone's foot claps, look at my foot here. This is a, what we call your navicular bone. When your foot collapses, you can see the navicular drop in. You know, we call this the navicular drop. So if you see someone squatting and their navicular drops in, that's a problem. If someone lands, the navicular drops in, that's a problem. So <laughs> Justin's got a flat foot, but his navicular doesn't change as he's squatting. His navicular doesn't change as he's landing. Does that make sense? So there's good stability all the way down through the foot. One of the things we've been working on a lot here, uh, which is a, a shoulder mobility drill uh, that seems to work a lot of magic. Okay. So go ahead and scoot out a little bit, Justin. So we're, there's three there's three things that we're cueing here that we're going to work on. We're gonna we're gonna use this band here to distract his humeral head from the glenohumeral joint. Scoot out more so you get more pressure. Can we maybe squat at the front? So we yeah, yeah. Look down. Do a little. So I'm gonna pretend to be a joint I, socket and a, and, a, and a humerus humeral head. So I picked up this um, this technique by watching Mobility Watt, um, and and I don't have a super awesome mechanical explanation for why joint uh, distraction works. My my thinking about it is essentially that there's a lot of kind of fuzz around a joint that, that can compact it together, and when we open it up, we give the nervous system more room to breathe and feel okay with that uh, that movement out. Uh, allowing that movement, right? And we're gonna avoid kind of impinging. So as I move his shoulder around, what I don't wanna do is I don't wanna bang his femur up against, or his humerus up against his uh, glenohumeral joint. Is that a, a fair description of what's going on and why this is a good technique? It's all magic and we, we just have various ways of describing it, so. Okay, <laughs> yes, yes, it's as good as I've heard. Yeah. Okay. Joints get compacted all the time, they all have yeah. to be open. Okay, yeah. so the second thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push down on his joint here, okay? This is where we're talking about approximation, okay? We're trying to get him to the back of his joint socket. So, just in particular has shoulders that are really kind of far forward in the socket. Um, and this is a problem. Uh, we see a lot of elbow pain in parkour because people's shoulders are kind of forward in the socket and they press down on the uh, brachial nerve, which goes, becomes the ulnar nerve, which is where we have a lot of elbow pain, a medial epicondylitis type of pain. So we want to kind of mobilize the shoulders to the back of the socket. If you imagine we're here all the time, we're sitting here all the time, imagine that essentially all the, 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 the body's responding to it by, by tightening up that back of the socket, by becoming less willing to let you have that mobility. So what we want to do is sort of force the play with the body and uh, in getting it to uh, to accept this greater range of motion here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just be trying to get his shoulder. I want his hu his humeral head to literally basically be pushed against the ground. Make sense? At the same time, I don't want his elbow to making up for it, so I'll lock his elbow. You can do this to yourself by using a kettlebell. Um, that's what we normally do. Uh, just this weekend, we've been playing with. Uh, with doing it actively to each other and found, wow, this is really awesome and super effective. So now the third thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to do some external rotation. External rotation of the shoulder tends to uh, really kind of be a problem for us. We are constantly um, in an internally rotated position. And in addition, we tend to spend a lot of time strengthening and training the internal rotators of the shoulder. If your guy has done a lot of bench press, you may have a lot of problems with internal rotation, with being kind of overly internally rotated as a general position. So as I just kind of work him through, I'm basically creating room in the back of the socket. So this is primarily not a muscular stretch. It's primarily, well, uh, we talked about that joint capsule. We're trying to get the joint capsule to allow more. So now, after sort of passively accepting that, he's going to try to actively do it. So go ahead and externally rotate your shoulder. Yeah. So let that shoulder stay back as you do it. There we go. Keep that elbow locked. And now, boom, I'm gonna give you a little bit of resistance. How's this feeling? My arm is numb. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't really want to go too far with getting numb. Okay. So, so I was going to say, how's this feeling? Is a really excellent question. <laughs> okay. So now bring your bring your hands up here, and 
I don't know if you guys can see, but this finger is higher than this finger. Do you guys see that? Yeah. We, it's not super obvious. I don't know if the camera will pick it up. Uh, <laughs> I got, I had oh, wow. Ox yeah. do this to me earlier and he crushed me because he's a big strong dude. <laughs> um, and it made a huge difference. It was like two inches. So then we're going to drop here. Another big test that's really important in parkour is uh, internal rotation of the shoulder. So I'm just going to let his hands drop so I want him to relax as much as possible and we'll see what the, act, uh, the passive range of motion is in the two hands. <laughs> okay. So now go ahead and stand up. And arms overhead. Show us your overhead position. You guys see a difference here? Okay, yeah. this hand is further back, this yeah. Yeah. armpit is closer to the ear. So by creating that external rotation, essentially we create room for the shoulder to get back. Justin's got tight shoulders, so he's going to tend to, when he wants to make a overhead position, to hyperextend through the thoracic spine. Can I see something real quick? Yes. Yeah. As you turn around, Justin. What I'm curious about is, is not just how high are his arms, but what's the humerus versus scapula position? So I don't know, but it sure looks like this scapula is having to work a lot harder to get up versus this one. So we're just going to try and find the inferior angle of the scapula here. Okay. And sure enough, yeah, in fact, take your shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> Respect. <laughs> hey, come on back up. Okay. So, I don't know if you can see the angle here versus the angle there, but this scapula, okay, is, is significantly more upwardly rotated on this side. That means that as, as far as, you know, all just, Justin has this thought, like, I want to go get up and reach that wall, right? I want to reach that bar. Okay? And, his, and his, his body says, okay, well, let's figure out how to do it. On, the, on this side, there's enough range of motion here that the scapula still has a good swing to it before he gets to end range. Okay? Versus on this side, the scapula is already up here, which means at some point it's going to reach end range. All this stuff is working harder. You may, you may even see the trap working harder up here. Okay? So, positioning is strength. Okay? He's working harder on the right. Does it feel like you're working harder on the right side? Yeah, it's hard. Okay, so a lot more fatigue, a lot harder work, um, and it didn't, didn't take long to create that change. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, good. Any, any more thoughts? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> leave it off. <laughs> we were all <laughs> okay. Uh, you can um, uh, you can find someone to, uh, to work with the other side. We want to work down the body. Talk about how we mobilize some of these these other tissues. Right. Um, the hip joint also super important. We talk about unslinging that hip joint. So before I did my runs this weekend and before I jammed today, I took this setup right here and I try to create the freedom to squat. So let's do a little pre-test, post-test. So this is me squatting right now. I'm trying my hardest to keep it out. Okay, this is about end range with good position. So I'm clearly above parallel. I'm gonna go ahead and go down. You can see in order to get into the hole, I'm making a lot of compromises in my lower dotted curve. I also feel a real tendency right now to want my knees to pull in. This is much easier than this, okay? Oh, I can sit here, which is good for me. I'm not as stiff as I am sometimes, but if I sit here pretty long, I would get tired and want to do this, okay? So, we're gonna play with the same principles here um, of kind of opening up that, uh, that joint. So I'm gonna get in here, huh? <laughs> and I'm basically going to, uh, I'm trying to, to take the femur back, this is almost the same mobilization, but we're using the femur to the joint capsule instead of the humerus to the joint capsule. All right? Boom. And I can work on externally rotating through my joint capsule right here. Boom. Oh, this is intense. But here's the, the band distracting, pushing me back. Oh, okay. Fun stuff. Okay, so 
don't want to spend too much time there because you're just doing a little presentation. But let's see now. I'm going to squat down again and we're going to see if there's a little bit of a difference on that side. Okay, let's go. Where does my back start breaking? Right there. Is that lower than it was before? And that's just on one side and I can feel the difference dramatically. This knee wants to stay out. Uh, take a look at my, if you can see my, uh, my navicular, which foot is facing forward, which, which ankle wants to collapse in. And, this, and if I sit here, I start to feel this little stress in my MCL, it's not fun. Okay? Positioning is power and injury prevention. Your rib cage looks better on the right side too. <laughs> okay, here we go. It's all connected, right?